9.2 Lesson 2, Series and Converges. So our objectives in Lesson 2 are 1. Identify telescoping series. 2. Determine whether a telescoping series converges by examining the limit of the nth partial sum as n approaches infinity. And 3. Identify geometric series and determine whether a geometric series converges or diverges. So obviously 3 is separate from 1 and 2. Vocabulary, telescoping series, and geometric series. Before we get started by going over an activity to uh, learn about convergence of telescoping series, we'd like to review something that we learned yesterday, which is the definition of a convergent series, because that relates to what we want to understand for objective two. So from yesterday, we have the definitions of convergent and divergent series, and here's what we know. Uh, if you have an infinite series, S sub n represents the nth partial sum, which is the sum of the first n terms from our series. And we learned yesterday what it means for an infinite series to converge. We consider the sequence of partial sums. If the sequence of partial sums converges, then we say the series converges. So when you're looking at objective two here, this relates to what we learned yesterday about what it means for a series to converge. We have to consider the sequence of partial sums. Will the sequence of partial sums converge to a particular value? If the answer is yes, then the series will converge to that value. And that's what this limit is telling us to find. It's telling us to find whether the sequence of partial sums will converge. So you may remember from section 9.1 that if you have a particular sequence, how do you determine that a sequence converges? You look at the limit of the nth term as n approaches infinity, and if that limit exists, then we say the sequence converges. So we're using that in conjunction with what we learned yesterday about what it means for a series to converge, we look at the sequence of partial sums and we want to see if the sequence of partial sums converges because if it does, then by this definition, the series converges. So our first two objectives uh, have to do with what we just talked about. We want to know if a telescoping series converges by examining the formula for its nth partial sum and seeing if the limit of the nth partial sum as n approaches infinity exists. So here we have an activity to help us work on the first two objectives for today's lesson. Uh, number one, write the first five terms of the sequence. So you just uh, substitute n is equal to one, two, 3, 4, and 5 into the formula for the nth term of our sequence. And the formula has two fractions that are subtracted. So for each fraction, you will substitute the value of n. And when you do that, these are the terms of the sequence that we have. And in number two, what we're doing is we're forming a series by using the same formula for the nth term. So we have the same formula for the nth term, and we're forming an infinite series by adding these terms. So in number two, you're supposed to find partial sums of our infinite series. So S sub one is the first partial sum, so it's just the first term of the series, which would be one minus one third. You could write that as two thirds, but we'll leave it as one minus one third. And S sub 2 is the second partial sum, so you're going to add the first two terms of your series. And an interesting, an interesting thing happens here. When you add these two terms, negative one-third added to one-third will give you zero, so you're just left with one minus one-fifth. And for the third partial sum, you're going to add the first three terms of your infinite series, which of course are shown in the table from number one. And if you add the first three terms, again, an, interest thing, an, an interesting thing happens. 
when you add the first three terms, the negative one-third and the one-third will add to zero, and the negative one-fifth and the one-fifth will add to zero, leaving you with one minus one-seventh for the third partial sum of our infinite series. And, and you might start noticing a pattern, but we want to uh, continue with the fourth and the fifth partial sums before we try to write a general formula for the nth partial sum. So when you add the first four terms of the series, this is what you'll have. So again, the pattern holds. When you add the first four terms, an interesting thing happens. Uh, certain parts of the terms will add to zero. So that continues and you have negative one-seventh plus one-seventh is zero. So you have one minus one-ninth and that's going to be of course eight-ninths but we don't need to write that. We can just leave it as one minus one-ninth. And the fifth partial sum, add the first five terms and again an interesting thing happens. Uh, certain fractions uh, from our fifth partial sum will add to give us zero. So all we're left with for the fifth partial sum is uh, the first fraction from the very first term, which is one, and the last fraction from the fifth term, which is one over eleven. And of course we're subtracting, so we have minus one over eleven. So now, based on this pattern, we'd like to see if we can write a general formula for the nth partial sum of our infinite series. So in writing the general formula, we're going to say that we're going to have one at the very beginning. Because if you look at the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth partial sums, they all have one minus a particular fraction. So we expect that the nth partial sum will be the same. So s sub n will be 1 minus. But what are we going to subtract? If you look at the first partial sum, we subtracted 1 third, which is the second fraction of the first term. Uh, if you look at the second partial sum, we subtracted 1 fifth, which is the second fraction of the second term. If you look at the third partial sum, we subtracted 1 seventh, which is the second fraction of the third term. For the fourth partial sum, we subtracted one-ninth, which is the second fraction of the fourth term. And for the fifth partial sum, we subtracted one-eleventh, which is the second fraction of the fifth term. So what we're subtracting is the second fraction of the nth term. And what is the formula for the second fraction of the nth term? You can see right here, this is the formula for the second fraction of the nth term. So our formula for the nth partial sum will be 1 minus 1 over 2n plus 1. So you can also write the nth partial sum this way, but uh, what we have here is fine. And it, it comes directly from the pattern that we observed. And we're going to take the limit of the nth partial sum as n approaches infinity. And why do we do that? Because the definition of a convergent series states that a series, an infinite series, will converge if its sequence of partial sums converges. So what is the sequence of partial sums? So the sequence of partial sums is this, where S sub n is given by our formula. Does this sequence of partial sums converge? How do you know if a sequence converges? You take the limit of the nth term as n approaches infinity to determine if a sequence converges by definition. So if this sequence of partial sums converges, then by the definition of a convergent series, our telescoping series must converge. So we have the limit as n approaches infinity of the nth partial sum of our telescoping series. And of course, when you take this limit, it's really easy to do. n is approaching infinity, so as n goes to infinity, the denominator of this fraction will go to infinity, so the fraction will go to zero. And the limit 
of the nth partial sum as n approaches infinity is 1. So the sequence of partial sums for our series converges to 1, so by definition, our series, our telescoping series, converges to 1. And this is what we saw yesterday with the definitions of convergent and divergent series. What does it mean for an infinite series to converge? You consider its sequence of partial sums, and by definition, if the sequence of partial sums converges, then the infinite series converges. So, we looked at an example of a telescoping series. Now, why do we call the series from our activity a telescoping series? Because you may have a telescope that you've seen maybe in pirate movies, and what you can do is you can close the telescope, and different segments will kind of fold inside, and you have something that's really condensed. And that's what we saw with the telescoping series. Uh, the different fractions in the middle of our sum added to zero, leaving with just one from the very beginning, and we're subtracting the second fraction from the nth uh, term. So that series, the terms of the series telescoped when we added them together. So uh, objective two, you'll be able to determine whether a telescoping series converges by examining the limit of the nth partial sum, and of course we just did that. Uh, and now we're ready to move on to objective three about geometric series. I will be able to identify geometric series and determine whether the series converges or diverges. Now we'll take a look at objective three. You'll be able to identify geometric series. So the first part of the objective is to identify geometric series. So a question was asked by a student how do you know by looking at a particular series what type of series it might be? So we answer the question for a telescoping series. Uh, so how do you know by looking at a series that it might be a geometric series? How do you identify a given series as geometric? So we'll begin with that discussion, and then we will determine whether our geometric series converges or diverges. Vocabulary, geometric series. So we begin with identification. A geometric series has this form where the nth term is written as a times r to the n. And r is called the common ratio. In a previous math class, you learned about geometric series. And what we learned in that class is that pairs of consecutive terms have a common ratio. And that's what makes a series a geometric series. So let's look at a specific example of a geometric series. And there are a couple of conditions. A cannot be 0 and R should not be 0 either. Let's take a look at a specific example, a specific example of a geometric series where A is equal to 3 and R is equal to 2. So we start at n is equal to 0, and we use the formula for the nth term to write the 0th term, the 1st term, the 2nd term, and the 3rd term. And because we have a series, we're adding these terms. And when we do that, we get 3 plus 6 plus 12 plus 24. So why is this a geometric series? Because when you look at pairs of consecutive terms, like for example, if you look at n sub 3, uh, n is equal to 3, and n is equal to 2, which are actually the fourth and the third terms of our series. When you divide them, you get 24 divided by 12 is 2. But if you divide 12 by 6, you also get 2. And if you divide 6 by 3, you also get 2. So 2 is what we call the common ratio. And if you have a series of this form, we call that a geometric series. The next thing that we want to do is determine whether a given geometric series will converge or diverge. And it's pretty easy to do because of a theorem. You just have to look at the value of the common ratio. You look at the absolute value of the common ratio, and based on what that value is, you can tell whether the geometric series will converge or diverge. 
So how do you know if a given geometric series converges or diverges? You use theorem 9.6, the convergence of a geometric series. A geometric series with common ratio r diverges if the absolute value of the common ratio is greater than or equal to 1. So the example that we looked at where the absolute value of the common ratio was equal to 2 would be an example of a geometric series that diverges. So we know that this geometric series diverges by the theorem that we just looked at because the absolute value of the common ratio is 2. How do you know if a geometric series converges? If the absolute value of the common ratio is between 0 and 1, then the geometric series converges. But not only do we know that it converges, we also know the value that it will converge to. It's given by this formula. You sh should be careful about one thing. In the formula, uh, the index for the geometric series starts at n is equal to 0. So if you have a problem where you have a convergent geometric series, but the index starts at 1, for example, that means you're missing the 0th term. So from this formula, you have to subtract the 0th term that you're missing. So here we're taking a look at an example, and you want to first identify this particular series as being a geometric series. And so a geometric series has the form that I'm writing here, a times r to the n. So does the given series have this form? We'll find out. So you want to write it in that form, so you can write that as 3 times 1 over 2 to the n. And of course, you can write 1 as 1 to the n, because 1 raised to any power will just be 1. So the given series is of the form a times r to the n. So we do have a geometric series. And you can write 1 to the n over 2 to the n as 1 over 2 to the n by using a property of exponents. So as we can see, we have a geometric series where a is equal to 3 and where r is equal to 1 half. And because the absolute value of the common ratio is 1 half, which is, of course, between 0 and 1, we know this particular geometric series will converge. This geometric series will converge. But the theorem is more useful than that. It will actually tell us the value that the infinite series will converge to. What is the sum? What is the sum of the infinite series? We can find out by using the result of this theorem. The theorem states that the sum of the infinite series will be a divided by 1 minus r, but n has to start at 0. Well, n starts at 0 for us, so that's not an issue. So we're going to have that the sum of our series is a, minus, a divided by 1 minus r. So we will have a, which is 3 for us, 3 divided by 1 minus r, 1 minus 1 half. And of course, 1 minus 1 half is 1 half, and 3 divided by 1 half is 6. So that is the sum, or the infinite sum, of our infinite series. So if you were to add all of the infinitely many terms from this series, the sum would be 6. Now what happens if you have a similar example to what we just did? Let's say it's exactly the same except that our index starts at 1 instead of 0. But let's say it's exactly the same. Well, you can use the same formula, but you have to subtract the term that you're missing. If the index starts at 1, you're missing what happens when n is equal to 0. So you would do exactly the same work that we just did and find the sum of the infinite series where the index starts at 0 and subtract the missing term. So this sum would be equal to the sum where the index starts at 0 minus the term that we're missing, which would be 3 over 2 to the 0. So we already found out that this sum 
using the formula is 6, and we're going to subtract from that 3 divided by 2 to the 0. 2 to the 0 is 1, so 3 divided by 1 is 3. So this particular series will have an infinite sum that's equal to 3 and not 6. Now that we understand what this theorem states and how it can be used, we'd like to look at why it's true. We'd like to look at the proof of this theorem. So let's read the theorem once again. A geometric series with common ratio r diverges if the absolute value of the common ratio is greater than or equal to 1. On the other hand, if the absolute value of the common ratio is between 0 and 1, then the series converges uh, to this sum. So how, why is this true? And we'll look at that by looking at this proof that's provided in the textbook. Uh, so it begins by stating that it is easy to see that the series diverges if the absolute value of the common ratio is either 1 or negative 1. And, and you can see why that would have to be the case. Uh, for example, if the absolute value of the common ratio is positive 1, uh, then you would just have the nth term would be a. So no matter what n is, you will always have a, and if you just keep adding a each time, uh, the sum of the series will not be finite. It will be infinite. And you can try to understand why it would also diverge if n is equal, to, if r is equal to negative 1 by thinking about that on your own. But So we want to consider what happens if r is not equal to 1 or negative 1. We know the series will diverge if r is equal to 1 or negative 1, but what happens if r is not 1 or negative 1? So here we write the formula for the nth partial sum of our geometric series. Again, what is the nth partial sum? It is just the sum of the first n terms of the geometric series. So the first term you get when n is equal to 0. And again, this is the description of the nth term. And you get the first term when n is equal to 0. So you have r to the 0, which is uh, you have r to the 0, which is 1. So you have when n is equal to 0, you have r to the 0, which is 1. So you just have a times 1. When n is equal to 1, you have r to the first, which is r, so you have a times r. When n is equal to 2, you have r to the second, so you have a times r to the second. So for the nth partial sum, you can see that what we have here is what we call the third partial sum, but the third term, the exponent for r is 1 less than 3. So for the nth partial sum, the exponent for r will be 1 less than n. So, so that's what we get from the pattern that we observe. So here we have the formula for the nth partial sum. Now we're going to go through a couple of clever steps, uh, and you'll see why this is very nice when we go through the rest of the proof. We actually will begin by multiplying both sides of this equation by r. So when you multiply the left side of the equation by r, you get r times the nth partial sum. And when you multiply the right side of the equation by r, you have to multiply each term of the right side by r. So you have a times r for the first term, and you have a r times r, which will give you a r squared, and then you have a r squared times r, which will give you a r cubed, all the way to the last term when you multiply it by r, you get a r to the n minus 1 by r, and you'll get a r to the n. So why are we doing this? Uh, again, our goal is to get this formula. We want to show that the sum of this infinite series that converges will be a over 1 minus r. And you'll see how what we're doing will help us get there. So we're going to do another clever step. We're going to subtract the second equation from the first equation. So when you subtract the second equation from the first equation, so when you subtract the left sides of the equation, when you subtract the left sides of the equation, you'll have the nth partial sum minus r times the nth partial sum. And when you subtract the right sides of the equation, look at what happens. 
when you subtract the right sides of the equation, you're going to take the nth partial sum, which is given by the sum of all of these terms, and subtract from that all of these terms. Well, what happens is this. When you subtract, you have a times r minus a times r. That will subtract to give you 0. a times r to the second minus a times r to the second. That will subtract to give you 0, and so on. Uh, a times r to the n minus 1 will subtract with the term right before this to give you 0. So what are you left with? You're just left with a uh, minus a times r to the n. So that's what we're writing here. a minus a times r to the n. So now what do we do? So you can just factor out s sub n from the left side of this equation to get s sub n times 1 minus r is equal to, and then from the right side of the equation, you can factor out an a from each term to give you a times 1 minus r to the n. So now you can take this equation and you can solve for s sub n. If you solve this equation for s sub n, you need to divide both sides of the equation by 1 minus r, and when we do that, we get this. You take a times 1 minus r to the n and divide by 1 minus r. And you can just rewrite it like this, the way it's written in the textbook, just by writing a times 1 minus r to the n divided by 1 minus r as a divided by 1 minus r times 1 minus r to the n. Now, why, do we, why is this useful for us? Because if you go back to the definition of a convergent series, the definition of a convergent series states that a series will converge if its sequence of partial sums will converge. And here we have a formula for the nth partial sum of our geometric series. So let's see what happens with this nth partial sum of the geometric series because from the definition of a convergent series, a series will converge if its sequence of partial sums converges. So what is going on here? Well, whether this sequence of partial sums will converge depends on the value of the common ratio r. And if the absolute value of the common ratio is between 0 and 1, here's what happens. So, for example, uh, maybe it's r is equal to 1 half. So, look at this part, r to the n. What happens to 1 half to the n as n approaches infinity? As n approaches infinity, 1 half to the n will go to 0. And that will happen whenever you have an r value whose absolute value is between 0 and 1. So if that's the case for r, then this r to the n will go to 0. This r to the n will go to 0 as n approaches infinity. So the nth partial sum, when you take the limit of the nth partial sum by the definition of a convergent series, when you take the limit of the nth partial sum as n approaches infinity, uh, r to the n will go to 0 whenever the absolute value of the common ratio is between 0 and 1. So, what that means is, if this particular condition for the absolute value of the common ratio is satisfied, the limit of the nth partial sum will be equal to a over 1 minus r, which is, of course, a finite number, and therefore the limit will exist, and the series will converge to that value. So the series will converge, and its sum will be a over 1 minus r. And it says here, it is left to you to show that the series diverges if the absolute value of the common ratio is greater than 1. And you would basically, uh, to do that, you would basically go back to this formula for the nth partial sum, and you would have to make an argument that if the absolute value of the common ratio is greater than 1, the uh, limit of the nth partial sum as n approaches infinity does not exist, which means the sequence of partial sums will diverge, and therefore the series will diverge by definition. 
So we just looked at objective three, where we are identifying if a geometric, whether we have a geometric series, how to identify that you have a geometric series, and then we're using the theorem to determine whether the series converges or diverges, and of course, we also looked at a proof of the theorem.